Dankeschön, merci à tous. Um, I will apologize at the outset that um, uh, people who know me tell me that I speak too fast for them to understand me in English. I understand this will be a bit, of a bit of a challenge with translation. You can let me know with your faces if I'm going too fast and I will try to slow down. Um, with that said, there's a lot to cover. I, I've been very pleased actually by the range of talks that we've seen today. Much of what's in my talk has actually already been covered, uh, which is sort of surprising to me. So I think the level of conversation that's happening regarding the problem of, of providing fish passage is already at a pretty high level here. So it's actually very encouraging um, and it seems like things are actually moving in the, in the right direction. That's really good. So what I want to try to present you with today is a talk in three parts. For the first part, I want to talk a little bit about the history of fish passage and how we got to where we are today. In particular, I want to compare today's situation with where things were about 100 years ago. Then I'm going to move into some theory um, really think about what it is that we're trying to do with fish passage, what we're trying to achieve, and how we can maybe use that information toward improving passage. And then finally, I'll, I'll finish with a couple of small case studies that uh, show some examples of how um, you know, carefully designed studies can provide the kind of information that's needed. Uh, and actually, I want to, there was um, one of the earlier speakers this afternoon already mentioned this problem of uh, fishway evaluations that get done, it seems that everybody has their own idea of what to do. What I want to propose today is there's actually a right way to do this. There are more, there's maybe more than one, but there's a minimal right way to evaluate a fishway, and that if we all can agree with some basic mathematics, we might be able to move toward a place where we can begin to compare fish ladders. And I'll show you some examples of, of why that's an issue. So um, to begin then, a little bit of history and thinking about uh, some of the literature from 100, 150 years ago, uh, I became interested in this by, uh, I was looking at the very first issue of the Transactions of the American Fishery Society, volume one, issue one, and I was thumbing through it and I realized that one of the topics that they were concerned with was the failure of fishways. And there was a heated di discussion and debate as to why fishways weren't working. So the very beginning of the American Fishery Society in 1870, already this is one of the primary reasons for fisheries biologists and engineers and managers to get together is to solve what they believed at that time was a very important problem. So this is nothing new. Um, so we have a lot of designs that have been d developed over the years, and these are some of the 19th century or early 20th century designs, structure that was built in the 19th century on the Potomac River. Some of them really ingenious, actually. If you look at this, we could get into how this one works with this. It has these reverse baffles, and water is actually ejected back up through here. Some really neat and fascinating ideas by some bright people uh, working on these designs. Um, this is a French fishway. So anyway, the, the state of... <laughs> And the French have been building them too. Um, but I am going to give you a North American perspective. So this is from Wall, 1873. And one of the concerns in the 1870s was in particular the problem of shad and river herring, which you also have uh, here in Europe, maybe not here in Switzerland. But they have, they've been posing a particular problem for fish passage to everybody that's been trying to do this. And so we have this quote from Wall in 1873 that says, the timidity of the shad has baffled us a little at the outset, but we will yet accommodate him. And fishways will be made as attractive to him as to the salmon. So you get the idea here that they've had some success with salmon, but shad are causing them a problem. And in fact, the problem was very serious. This is a pretty optimistic way of putting these. So there is no doubt of ultimate success. We're moving in the right direction, even if we've got a little bump in the way. So 150 years ago almost, it's like, yeah, we have a little problem here, but we're, we're getting there. We'll, we'll solve this soon. Um, luckily, it was only 18 years later that we have Rogers, 19 years, 1892, who solved it. So here's his fishway, and the Rogers fishway leaves nothing to be desired in a successful fish way. Therefore, there is no need in longer spending money in fruitless experiments on theoretical and useless devices as in the past, but address ourselves to the more practical work of passing the fish up the stream as swiftly as possible. So, so he solved it. 1892, fish way, fish passage was solved. No problem. We've got the 
this nailed, everything's great, let's just build them. We don't need to worry about theory or about science. We can just build structures. We know they'll work. So to sum up, the state of Fish Passage in 1914 was that, um, well, Rogers, it turned out, as you all know, was wrong. And uh, so we have poor fish passage at obstacles. Fishways aren't working. Some claim to have the problem solved, but the broader community recognized that that was not really true. Um, salmon and eels were passing these structures, so there was some success already there, but shad were really a problem, and many other species weren't using these. Uh, and so in response to that, there was this movement toward nature-like fishways and spiral design. So again, some of the innovative designs that have been showing up over in the past couple of decades were also being applied 100 years previously, um, largely because of this recognition of the, you know, the, the failings of technical fishways. So fast forward 100 years, and we have in 2012 a paper by Williams et al. And among those et al. are uh, Greg Armstrong, Chris Catapotis, Michel Arigné, and Travad. So names that you'll be familiar with. And again, what do we see? Research and experience suggest with sufficient laboratory testing it's possible to determine the conditions that fish will actively use as a conduit to develop a fishway that will effectively pass most upstream migrants of any species over a dam of just about any height. So good, 2012, now we've got it nailed. We know what we're doing. Everything has been solved. There's really no excuse for not building fishways because we have this, this nut cracked. Um, <clears throat> The Germans have, um, I don't want to pick too much on the Germans, but there were recent guidelines that came out that suggested, and we heard about this, that in fact, if you build a fishway to the design specifications, you can be assured that it will work effectively. Therefore, there is no need to perform evaluations because we know that we can uh, build these effectively. This is maybe being a little bit unfair, as we heard today. There's, there's more nuance to this than, than what I'm suggesting in this, in this slide. But, um, but there is a real pressure here, right? Because we're building expensive structures. We're asking people to do things that they don't necessarily want to do, and it's going to be expensive. You want to be able to say that this is going to work and provide some assurance. Um, well, so the, the thing about that Williams paper uh, in 2012, what's interesting is in the very same volume of the very same issue of that journal was the paper by Bunt et al. 2012. And so that paper, I was actually one of the co-authors there, and what we did was we went through the entire published literature, uh, identified 200 papers that claimed to have evaluated a fishway. Of those 200 papers, only 19 papers actually provided the information on what proportion of the fish passed that entered. So they identified the entrance and the exit. Only 19 of 200 papers actually measured both entry and exit. And you need both of those if you're going to talk about what percent are going to pass the fishway. If they don't enter the fishway, they can't very well pass it, can they? Okay, so, so right. I mean, this is, this is why I get paid what I get paid. Um, these, these deep insights. So anyway, we have percent passage then, and we looked at the four primary fishway types of pool and weir, vertical slot, denial, and then the nature-like fishways or bypass channels. And what you'll see here is out of those 200 papers, we're down to 19 that we can really use. Of those 19, we see a range of different species and different families, four different types. And ultimately, what we end up with is being able to tell you that we can say with some confidence that a fishway of any type will pass somewhere between zero and 100% of the fish that enter it. So, so we're making progress here. Um, that, but it, it's a little better than that because it does turn out that it looks like nature-like fishways show some promise, right? We, see, we do see a trend with some improved passage in nature-like fishways, worse passage there, but the variability in performance was very troubling. Okay, and one of the things that was most disturbing to us was that because there were so few studies available, we couldn't look at the effect of slope. We couldn't look at the effect of temperature or species effectively just because we, we failed to have sufficient data with which to actually perform any kind of meaningful statistical analysis and identify whether one structure was actually better than another structure. So, one of the other things that you get when you monitor both the bottom and the top of a fishway is that you can tell what proportion of your fish actually enter. So that was the other thing that we looked at in this paper was what proportion we're entering. And again, you'll see this broad range somewhere between zero and 100%, although it did look like some of our technical fishways were performing better than the nature-like fishways. And it looks like we have a real problem in the nature-like designs with poor entry rates, maybe better passage, but poor entry. So it becomes pretty clear from this that that if we don't pay attention to both entry and passage, we're going to have a problem in understanding what's going on. And if we see a fishway that's failing to pass fish, 
without performing at least two different measures, we're not going to really know what the cause of that failure is. And we can try to fix the hydraulics inside a fishway, but if the fish are never finding that entrance, then we're not really try we're not working on the right problem. So again, we found similar results. What was nice was that at th that same year, as our paper came out, there was another paper by Noonan et al., who, an independent group, who performed a very similar task. So they combed a different database, different set of literature. They were really looking mostly at, at Salmonid papers and more recent literature than what we looked at, but they came to the same conclusion. So you see dark gray are salmonids and the light gray are non-salmonids, and these are the different fishway types. And you can see once again, yes, salmonids in some cases seem to be doing pretty well in some fishways, and by pretty well, by the way, we're talking 75% passage, 60% passage for the big, strong, highly motivated fish. So this is not all that great, to be honest, and it gets worse. So it was basically independent confirmation that in fact there really is a problem, and we have numbers on that problem, so we understand understand now that we can't really just go ahead and, and claim that we have fishway design solved. That, that claim is not really supported by the data. So if you look at 2014 and we look at the same slide, it's all the same bullets. You don't have to go through and read them. Basically, we are having the same discussions. We're confronted with very similar problems. What's new, however, is that we have new techniques and new technologies, and we have a much better understanding and ability to identify when things are working and when they're not. Um, so I already talked a little bit about what's keeping fishways from working. Um, in Buntadal, the conclusion was that existing data are not sufficient to support any particular design recommendations. And then there was a paper last year by Brown et al. that came out that suggested that it may be time to admit failure for fish passage um, and acknowledge that significant species restoration will not be possible without dam removal. So Brown et al. is suggesting that we just give up and just rip down all the dams and everything will be great. Um, I'm not going to you know, agree with Brown at all. I think they got to that conclusion a little quickly. Uh, and yet it does, I think it's important to recognize, in particular in the US, that's the conversation we're having now, is it's, it's becoming whether or not to rip out a dam as opposed to how can we you know, improve fish passage. So it's becoming difficult and important, ever more important, that we actually work at solving these problems of fish passage. So where are we at? We have a consensus is that the claims of victory are premature um, and that the problem is challenging, difficult, and complicated. There is another tool available, however, for challenging, difficult, complicated jobs, and that's called adaptive management. So basically what adaptive management does is it requires that you evaluate what you're doing and make changes as you go, just like what was suggested earlier today. So adaptive management can be sort of described with this flow chart where you start off really by identifying a problem. Okay, so you have an objective, what you're trying to do, you identify your problem, and in identifying that problem, you define your performance. So uh, like what Stefan was saying earlier, is our objective to restore healthy habitats or is it to restore passage? Well, for now, for this meeting, I think the objective is to, is to talk about passage, although I don't disagree with what Stefan was saying there at all. If you're going to establish passage, you need to talk about what that means. And it's not just a lot of fish coming out the top of a fishway, because if, if you have 10 times as many entering the bottom that don't come out the top, what are you doing? Is that successful? Maybe not. So we have to define our performance and we have to define it in the appropriate metrics. Then you assess your given location, design a solution, implement that design, and then monitor. Having monitored, you evaluate whether things are working and what might be causing you know, the performance that you're seeing. Is there anything better that we can do? Maybe we can make some adjustments. You adjust it, reassess the problem, modify your design, and so forth until you have the problem solved. So it becomes a rotational process wherein you actually incrementally approach a solution to a problem, and you don't expect that you're going to solve it correctly the first time out. And this is appropriate for where we are today with fishway design and development, is we don't have great, we should not have great confidence in our solutions, and yet we have a lot of experience and we have to try, right? We have to try to do something because I think we all agree that there's a problem. So using this approach of adaptive management, it becomes possible to acknowledge there will be some issues and be prepared to make modifications and adjustments just like we heard earlier today. Unfortunately, what we typically see, at least in the US, is recognition of a problem, build a solution, and implement it, and then you're done, and what you end up with is a little piece of fish, maybe, somewhere. Um, but clearly, that, that's, not, that's not the solution that we need. We need to you know, in, finish the cycle here for adaptive management to really uh, perform this properly. Okay. So for adaptive management to work, then we need evaluations that are 
uh, appropriate to the question, appropriate to what it is that we're trying to do, or in other words, we need uh, evaluations that, that quantify, that measure the performance. So performance has to be defined in a way that we can quantify, and if we can agree on what that performance is, then we can all start quantifying things the same way. We can begin to compare fishways and learn from all of these structures that are out there, because we have lots of fishways that are out there that are available for us to evaluate today. And we could learn a lot from those structures if we developed consistent evaluation methods. And we could save ourselves a lot of money by building more effective structures from the lessons that we learn. So we need performance metrics that are appropriate. And in order to do that, we have to recognize the drivers of fishway performance. And it turns out that when you think about what fish must do in order to pass a barrier, there are actually six ways that a fish can fail in passing a barrier. And there's only one way that a fish can actually succeed in passing that structure. So this is actually kind of fun because we've reduced this down now to where this is now mathematically complete and I'll try to convince you of that if I can uh, for the second part of this talk. So consider this schematic of a barrier. We have here a dam. We have issues of upstream passage. We have issues of downstream passage. Start with upstream. As a fish is, a, is migrating up the river, it has the entire river width to work with potentially, and yet we have over here a fish ladder with its attraction flow, and there's a zone near the entrance that the fish are able to detect that entrance. If the fish is on this side of the river, it will not detect that entrance. So the first task that a fish has to do is it has to find the entrance. Before it even actually enters it, it has to find it and to, in order to respond to it. So I'm going to refer to that as the guidance zone or the approach zone. As a fish is moving up the river and in this guidance zone and maybe searching for this entrance, that fish may be vulnerable to predation. It may lose its motivation to migrate. There are a number of things that could happen to that fish that will cause it to never actually reach that zone. It might turn around and abandon the migration. So you end up with fish that are moving forward and are reaching the zone, and then fish that are abandoning and leaving that zone. And of course, if a fish is only here for a few minutes and then it leaves, it doesn't have a lot of opportunity. Whereas if a fish is there for 18 days, well, that's a tremendous amount of opportunity. And if it takes them 18 days to find that fishway entrance, is that effective passage or not? So those are actually two rates I just described. There's a rate of forward movement, and then there's a rate of reversal. The same thing is true within the, the zone of entry. It's a much smaller zone, but the fish has to stay there long enough to find and respond to that entrance and make a decision to actually enter it. So this is the second zone and the second process that has to happen. The fish has to actually enter the structure, and they have to be held there long enough near the structure so that they can make that decision. So in some species of fish we see, and this is true of shad, they move very fast. They're very strong, fast swimmers. And so what they'll tend to do is they'll go by these zones very quickly, not have enough time to really respond to it, and so they fail to use the entrance. And then it might take them a very long time to find the entrance again. So we have a, another two methods of failure. Or, you know, one method, well, two methods of failure. They can fail to enter, um, or they can actually... They, they can fail to enter quickly, or they can leave too quickly. So those are two different rates that are going on there. And then the same thing happens once they enter a fishway. They can either pass quickly or they can pass slowly. But if they pass slowly, they better stay in the fishway for a long time, because if they're going slowly, then there's not enough opportunity. So all of that can be described with a simple equation, um, which we don't have to spend a lot of time on. But just, just um, in, in essence, what we have here is within each zone, you have a rate of moving forward, and you have a rate that you're leaving. So the rate of moving forward you can think of as this normal curve, um, and that describes from the moment they arrive within the zone, reach of the river, how long does it take them to reach that entrance. And then you have, this is the departure rate, if you can think of it that way. And then and when you take the product of those two, you end up with the actual proportion that arrive over time. And if you give them more time, more fish will arrive. So in this particular example, you will never see more than 50% of your fish arriving at that fishway entrance because of the rate of departure. Right? If, if they never left, eventually they would all get there. But basically, these guys are robbing this distribution of their right-hand tail. So if you measure all of these components, you end up with the ability to actually predict the passage. And what's nice about this is there are statistical methods that allow us to look at covariate effects, day-night effects, changes in flow, um, variables that change over time. So that was probably too much of that. I'm 
but thank you for bearing with me. Let's get back to some figures that, that maybe we can get our heads around a little easier. But I want you to keep that in the back of your mind that there are these different rates, because if we accept, and actually just sort of skipping back to this figure if I can, um, everything I described for a fish that's moving upstream is also true for a fish moving downstream, right? They have to approach the entrance, they have to locate it. Having found that entrance, they actually have to enter, and then they have passage th you know, through descent, and usually through a downstream passage that's assured, but not always. Sometimes they enter a structure and they're able to escape. Um, and maybe there are predators downstream, that becomes yet another issue. But in terms of passage success or failure, there are exactly six ways in which failure can occur. Um, and the only way to pass is if both of these uh, rates occur at, an, at a rate that is optimal for passage. So there's really only one way to get the fish through these structures, and that's why it's hard. Okay, so now to try to s demonstrate that with an illustration from some data, we actually published, Russell Perry and I developed a numerical model of a fish migration at a barrier to try and sort of illustrate this process so people could understand how to apply the methods that I'm talking about. And I'm going to go into this more at the workshop tomorrow. So the idea is imagine, again, we have our barrier. Now we're simulating a downstream uh, migration study, but again, the same uh, processes apply. Uh, and they're going to approach this structure. They have two different rate, routes through which they can pass the structure. They can go through the turbines or they can go over the spillway. We want them to go over the spillway because that hopefully will be the safer passage route. So having entered the four bay, they have different rates at which they arrive at these two zones. And if they go to the turbine zone, they detect that passage route and they do not detect the spillway passage route. And they may pass through the turbines without ever having you know, encountered the conditions at the spillway. Well, if the fish never encounters those conditions, it doesn't make sense to test the effect of the conditions for that fish. So try to illustrate a little bit more of how the study was laid out. The idea was we would have uh, six releases of 50 fish each. That's what we see here. And we're varying the spill condition from high to low. High spill should pass the fish faster. Low spill should pass them slower. And then these dots you'll see in a minute, those, de those describe when the fish actually entered the, um, the forebay and then whether they ended up passing through the, the spillway or through the turbines. And the spillway is in the circles. The turbines is by the triangles and the little cross indicate fish that died within the forebay because we allowed for death to occur within the forebay as well. So this flowchart tries to simulate this whole thing where you have the release site. Some fish never make it to the forebay. They die and you don't include those in your analysis. They need to get to the forebay. Having gotten to the forebay, they may go to the spillway or they may go to the turbines. They come to the turbines, they may not pass. They may return to the forebay. Once back up in the forebay, they could go either way again. So you have these different exposures, different amounts of time that they're exposed to the different conditions. And that total amount of time of exposure is what ultimately drives the probability of passage. So almost every study on passage that you see out there treats passage like it's a binary response. Did they pass? Did they not pass? What route did they choose? It's not a binary response. It's a process that takes time. Okay, and, and individual animals are exposed to different conditions. And so what we need to be able to do is to account for those conditions and control for the conditions in our understanding of what the effects are and how they influence overall passage. So eventually, you know, they can either die or they can pass, they get to the tail race, go out to the ocean. So um, here we are again coming down and we've discussed this enough already. Hopefully you can see it and we have the different rates of passage and we see where they actually, they actually selected these different routes. Um, so in the simulation, remember we have high and low spill conditions. The way we set this up was to say for the turbines, for fish that are in that entry zone of the turbines, there's no effect. Okay, so here we're looking at, actually they're not even in the entrance, this is just arriving. So this is that guidance process. So from the time they enter the four bay, it doesn't matter it does, whether they're spilling or not, or the condition of spill has no effect in this model on the rate at which they arrived at the turbines. We held that steady. However, we did make it so that under high spill, they got to the spillway faster. So they were more likely to arrive at the spillway zone, and they were likely to arrive there more quickly. So there's a time component to this, right? When spill was low, they were less likely, or they arrived more slowly to the, to the spillway, and because they arrived more slowly, they, they were actually more likely to arrive at the turbines. Okay. Then once they arrived at each of those entry zones, we have, again, the next pair of rates. So we have the retention time. So under high spill, um, under high spill in red, we have them staying a long time, relatively near that spillway. Under low spill, we gave them a very short residence time near the spillway. And again, the turbines are the same. So relative to low spill, we have greater retention time near the turbines, but less relative to high spill, and the spill had no effect 
on that turbine retention time. So you have these two different areas, and they're going to stay in those areas for different amounts of time, but the only, the only place where the treatment is affecting is at the spillway side. And again, this is true for the passage rate. Faster passage over spillway, no effect on the turbines. Okay, so we put all of this into our model for our simulated fish, and then if we simply count up where the fish went, okay, and then also look at their total time, and this is pretty interesting. If we look at their total time spent in the forebay uh, under the two different spill conditions, what we see is that under high spill, we get lower forebay residence time for both fish that go over the spillway and fish that pass through the turbines. However, at low spill, we get longer residence times for both groups. Now, why is that? Because you saw in the figures that turbine rates of movement did not change under high and low spill, and yet we see a difference here. So if you used standard statistical methods to look at this process and where the fish were passing and their overall delay, you would conclude that under high spill, you got faster passage through the turbines, which is not true, right? Um, well, actually, it is true. It's here in the data, but it's not caused by the high spill, it's an artifact. The reason that this happens is because more fish are passing over the spillway and they're passing faster over the spillway so that under the low spill conditions you have more fish available to pass through the turbines, they're available longer, so you end up with a greater proportion passing through the turbines, but the actual rate of passage through the turbines doesn't change. And that's the beauty of a model, is that we can know this going into it, so we know what we fed this model, and we know that this is a false interpretation of what's going on, and yet it is exactly true as far as our data are concerned. And this points to one of the problems we have in trying to understand fish passage and what's going on, is that the more intuitive approaches to analysis can sometimes be very misleading. Um, luckily, there's a solution, uh, which is to use a time-to-event approach. This is a method of analysis called survival analysis, typically, which was developed really for the biomedical industry for developing uh, clinical trials, but it's also used in engineering for materials testing, failure times, and so forth, that allows you to control for exposure time and different exposure times. When you apply this approach, you can see these heavy lines show what our, our estimate, based on the data, uh, would, it would predict for the true underlying curve. So here's the true underlying curves are the thin lines, and then the estimates based purely on telemetry data. So part of the simulation was that the fish had tags, the tags transmitted, there were imperfect recoveries, so it was very much like a true study. And you can see that by applying these methods, we actually came very close to estimating the actual underlying rates for you know, the, the retention time in the forebay, the, uh, and also the passage uh, times through these different routes. So using these methods, we were able to show that, yeah, there's no change in the turbines, the spillway was the same as the turbines at low spill, we had better passage at high spill. So anyway, the point being that if you use the correct tools to look at passage rates through these structures, and if we understand passage rate in a mathematically robust way that's defensible, we can actually come up with unbiased estimates of what's truly going on. So, um, with that, I'd like to give your brains a break and show you some data from real fish, no longer a model, and we'll leave Europe and go somewhere warmer. Um, we'll head to Brazil, the Porto Primavera fish ladder, uh, which is just here, and you can see the structure here. This is a ladder that is uh, about over 20 meters in height. Uh, it is of a design that would never be approved by our agencies or your agencies. It's, it's rather shocking what it looks like, and yet it seems to perform pretty well for certain species. So we did four species. I'm just going to show you two two of them here to illustrate some points. So here we're doing just a pit study. We don't have radio, so we actually, in this case, can't look at the rates of entry, um, except that we release some fish downstream and some fish within the ladder. So there is some information there, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about just what happened within the ladder for these fish. So just looking at passage within the ladder, it's the paku, it's a carassiform, they're delicious. Um, and if you look at this, we see overall passage looking quite good for, these, for this species. And if you look at the failure rates, so the passage rates are the growing functions, and the failure rates are described by the declining functions. And if you'll notice, these failure rates, they, there's some initial failure, and then it gets quite flat. So once they're in the fishway, they stay in the fishway. And that's important because they don't all pass on the first day. So here we see that initial passage, quite good, and then a delay here. Now what's happening? Gosh, 24 hours. That's interesting. 
Um, maybe the Paku has a diurnal pattern, and I, I haven't af actually gone into the data to know, but it's either a dawn or a dusk event, almost certainly, that's causing these two peaks in passage. So not only are we finding that they have rapid ascent and rapid passage through the fishway, but we're also learning that this particular species has a strong diurnal pattern, which will help us understand the components of passage performance and maybe things that we need to worry about for this particular species in designing that fishway. Um, by comparison, if we look at the armado, the armored catfish, we see very poor passage. Um, and yet we see also quite long retention times, however they do leave. So here we're seeing a, a, a prolonged uh, decline in residence in this fishway and a very slow passage occurring. So if these fish could be retained longer in the fishway, maybe eventually we would see a higher proportion passing, but we don't see, we actually see very low proportion passing ultimately, and that's largely because of the two factors, the two ways of failing, right? They're moving through too slowly, and they're not staying in long enough. So each zone has two ways in which they can fail, and the armored catfish are failing in both ways within this fishway. Um, so if I may, I'd like to take us to another continent, back to North America now, and uh, look at a little data from some sea lamprey that we were working at. This is now my home river. Uh, the lab where I work is actually located just here. It's the Connecticut River in New England. And we have, we're going to talk about the first three dams on the main stem of the Connecticut River. So Holyoke Dam was actually shown in one of the earlier slides. It's a fish lift uh, facility. And what we did was we captured sea lamprey returning um, at that fish lift facility and tagged them, again, only with pit tags because we had no money. Uh, so we did this whole study for $200. But we have, happened to have antennas at the next two fishways upstream. And I'm going to focus in on what happened at Turner's Falls here. We were interested in this case. I really just want to show you about that you can learn something from just pit telemetry for the rates of entry, provided that you have a highly motivated fish. So these data up here describe the release dates. So these were actually all released on the same day. However, what happened was they would fall back downstream and reascend, and, and we had a pit antenna at the Holyoke lift, and we took the last observation there as our entry time into the, you know, we call that the release time. It's a self-release time. So you'll see this first release group. We have one fish here that actually re-entered and reascended that fishway a couple of weeks after we actually released it. So that's, it's really, you know, we're going to call that the time of release for that fish. But anyway, these three groups, and one of the things that you should notice is if you look at here, from, from here to here, it's 60 kilometers between these two dams, and yet most of the fish are arriving in less than two days and entering the, the fishways here. So this is Turner's Falls. This is the second dam upstream. We have a fishway down here. That's where the powerhouse is, and then a second fishway up here. This is the bypass reach. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, but it's important to recognize there are two fishway entrances, two fishways that they have the opportunity to ascend, and most of them found that one first. Okay, So they, that's the closest one to Holyoke. They have to go by that one to get to this one. Point being, less than two days for these fish to arrive. They get here very quickly. So when you find very rapid arrival, and we're looking at over 60%, well, that's actually pretty successful, especially considering a lot of these fish were falling back downstream. So, so that's good. So there's an example of we can, we can pretty much say that we have pretty good attraction, pretty good entry into the fishway. Those first two components seem to be working fairly well for this fishway, for this species. There's a lot of habitat in between. The agencies are very happy with 60%, and the truth may be higher, maybe more like 75%. Um, what's problematic about this, though, is that we have these variables that are changing over time. So if we want to understand why they enter this fishway versus that, you know, what makes this fishway better than that one for some conditions, well, it makes sense to start looking at the flow. So we have flow and then temperature and trying to understand how these variables are affecting entry. There it is a little bit easier to see. Um, and so when we have these variables that are changing over time, and if you look back here, you'll notice that especially in this red group, the, the fish over here on the right are being exposed to a very different condition for flows from the fish that are, that are entering over here on the left. Likewise, these, this blue group is experiencing a different set of conditions from the green group. So how do we control for that? And how do we sort of assess what's happening under these changing conditions? And by the way, we also have day and night happening, right? We have nightfall every day almost. And so how does the difference in nocturnal and diurnal behavior, how does that influence the rate at which they migrate and their 
entry into the fishway structures. And here again, one of the strengths of this Cox regression approach, the survival analysis that I mentioned, is that it actually allows you to control specifically for each time interval what the variable effects were on that time interval. And when you do that, we can find some results. I'm just going to highlight here. So we see day and night here in a negative number. This is that first fishway. So negative 0.96, what that means is that they're almost 100% passing at night relative to the day. So we're seeing almost almost zero passage rate during the day. Uh, most of the entry, or entry rates, not passage, most of that entry is happening at night. However, if you look at the, the effect of flow through there, we find a positive effect here. And what this tells you is that they're actually per I think this is 10 cubic meters per second increase in flow. They double their entry rate during the day. So a, a regression approach actually allows you to tease apart these two things. So we might not have seen as strong of a diurnal effect if we had um, not been able to take into account the, the flow effect. Likewise, if we had not taken into account the diurnal effect, we might not have been able to detect that. You know, so in other words, we need to be able to put both of these into a model in a regression approach that allows us to look at that. The other thing we can see here, that's here's the second fishway, and we're seeing an 11-fold increase in the entry rate into the second fishway per I forget if it's 10 or 100 cubic meters increase in flow. So every incremental increase in flow, we see this dramatic increase in entry rate into that second fishway. So the point of all of this is that there are a set of statistical tools that exist that are appropriate for measuring movement and processes that take time. And that's what we should be using because if we can use these methods, we can start to insert into our fishway design questions, into our analyses questions like fishway design, slope, head pond, these kinds of things, and deal with these covariates that change over time, like what we're seeing here. So um, that is basically what I've got for you. And just to wrap up in terms of conclusions, we know that there's a lot of variability in fishway performance. Um, the variability is so great that we, don't, we should not have a great deal of confidence in the existing designs. Um, there's a tremendous number of structures that exist that could be evaluated if we performed rigorous and consistent evaluations on existing structures. We could then perform the necessary analyses with which to figure out what's working and what's not working and why. Uh, in order to do this, we need to consider rates-based processes because what we're evaluating are not binary responses, they're rates, and they're not certainly not just counts of fish. Um, they're competing risks, that's the idea that you can have multiple fates from a given zone. Um, there's a tool available that we can use. There's actually several survival analysis tools. Um, and if we use these tools and apply them to these things, we can actually develop an adaptive management protocol with which we can incrementally uh, modify and hopefully repair structures and improve passage for the fish that we care about. Thank you.